from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo this week in Evolution, episode 52, recorded on February 25th, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldy. Hey, Vincent. Good to be with you from the Wasatch Mountains. I'll be glad when February is over because it's hard to pronounce. <laughs> it's coming up. Only a few more days of uh, month pronunciation It'll left be to it. do. We're moving along in 2020. Ooh. That's for sure. I do like 2020. It just kind of runs off the tongue, right? Yeah, that's true. Easier the, to pronounce. The other day was 22020, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're hitting some of those landmark dates that you can prime numbers and anagrams and yeah. pull all the above. Are you done cl- or closing down your teaching or is that still going for the rest of the semester? Oh, yeah. We are we are going till May beginning oh, of wow. May. So yep. we are just on tomorrow's lecture 10 assembly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yesterday we did reverse transcription and integration. Mm-hmm. And you know, this year I've been, as much as possible, bringing a little bit of the new coronavirus into the lectures. And so, yeah, I was just going to ask when we did uh, receptors and entry, they had just found, they had just done nice experiments showing the, the receptor of the new virus was ACE2. And so I, I put that in, trying yeah, to make wow. it relevant to a little phylogenetics. Fantastic. Well, and speaking of relevance, so, you know, usually as evolutionary biologists, we try to not get caught up in the day's news. We try to take like a long view. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I think with this coronavirus situation that you mentioned, that it might be a good time for us to um, kind of take a closer peek. And the timing here is um, pretty, uh, things are running pretty hot. Uh, So if you just look at the, we're recording here on Tuesday, if you just look at this morning's, you know, news headlines, the mm-hmm. CDC now, um, you know, anticipating that there's going to be community spread in the U.S., that the um, virus will uh, continue. And so I think I, like probably many um, listeners to the This Week um, podcast series, have been tuning in recently to This Week in Virology, <laughs> sort of the central podcast of the series that you run. And um, have really been, uh, of course, interested and fascinated to hear um, this thing as it unfolds. And some of the great experts that you're bringing in, Ralph Barrick, uh, coronavirus um, guru, and others to discuss things sort of in real time here. So for this episode, actually, and I should say, so I was just at the barbershop on um, (laughs) (laughs) Saturday afternoon. And of course, you know, the barber was asking what I do for a living. And we didn't take long before... Mm. We were talking about what, how, what should he make of the fact that Lysol containers say there's coronavirus, that it can block coronavirus, and is this thing really a man-made or a human-made thing, or is it natural? And so, if, you know, we spent probably a half hour or hour just kicking around the virus as I got a you know a haircut that was yeah. probably several months overdue. But anyway, so I thought this would be a really fun opportunity for us to yeah, for sure. jump on some uh, of the, you have the latest. the evolutionary view, right? Yeah, and I think there's some really fascinating things that um, that sort of illustrate some core concepts in evolutionary biology, um, sort of through the lens of this real time news event, real time um, clinical event with the spread of coronavirus. So we um, have been talking a lot on Twitter about the China outbreak, which has now hit like high seventy thousands. And today, you know, there's this wonderful Johns Hopkins website. Do you know about that, Nels? You must, right? Yeah, I've been looking at it with some interest. So this is, I think, in the School of Public Health. Yeah. They have a this dashboard, which has a really good map um, that when you pull it up, focused in, the, um, in China. And I should just maybe mention, too, you know, for our listeners, if you uh, aren't already listening to TWIV, the last several weeks' episodes, and I'm anticipating – You'll probably be continuing this for a while. Um, uh, it, very worth it to to tune in and really get a lot more background here. But yeah, so this dashboard where you can see things like um, as they add more cases every day, uh, how uh, cases in different countries and the sort of dots on the map as this thing um, continues to unfold, a really useful resource there. So as of now, 
It's 77,660 cases on mainland China. Mm. And, you know, up till now, the U.S., we have 53. It's not a lot considering the traffic between China and the U.S., Mm-hmm. But um, now other countries, the numbers are starting to tick up. South Korea is going to break a thousand soon. Mm-hmm. We got a bunch in Italy, three hundred twenty-two, and then Iran just has a little outbreak. So, you know, we were weeks and weeks seeing this thing going in China, and nothing really overseas, very little. And now suddenly something, as my colleague Steve Morse said, someone had their finger in the dike, and now they pulled it out. Hmm. So, yeah, the CDC says it could be bad. I wonder why they think it's because they can't restrict travel any longer and people are slipping in with mild illness and they're incubating and spreading it. Yeah, no, good question. I mean, I would obviously not sort of my background or cup of tea, but in the epidemiology circles, whether those patterns that you mentioned in South Korea um, and in um, Iran and in um, Italy, just seeing maybe three independent sort of cases where it start starts to undergo community spread, yeah, whether that's yeah. enough of a pattern to start feeling like, okay, you know, as folks are, um, you know, moving around with, with some real restrictions. And it sounds like, you know, the current thinking for the um, uh, outbreak in China is that things might be cooling down. And in fact, yeah. when you go to that yeah. dashboard that you mentioned, right, that things are actually starting to level out. It is. Yeah. Um, yep. And so, but even, uh, even on that graph, if you look at international, it's not much. But however, if you go to the daily increase, mm-hmm. um, it's starting to. Well, you can't see the international on the daily increase; they only have the actual total. Yeah. But the daily the international, aside from China, is very low, but it's mounting. You know, and China's mm-hmm. peaked mm-hmm. for sure; it's mm-hmm. plateaued, and uh, mm-hmm. maybe they've handled it there. What? Um, is interesting is that first of all people shouldn't worry all that much yeah. because so we we did we did a paper last week on Twitter 80% of the cases are mild yeah no that's a really important point and i think we'll touch on that some of the evolutionary um sort of patterns maybe yeah. and comp- compare and contrast that to some other viruses out there but yeah no that's i think up front it, it's a really good idea to put a little bit of uh um you know it's kind of this news flash breaking stuff and to try to put a little bit of a damper on sort of the panic that could ensue. Yeah, and also people are saying, oh, is it going to get worse? And, Mm. you know, there's really no precedent for that. (laughs) Viruses mutate all the time, but they rarely get more virulent. I mean, this virus is really good at transmitting among people, and there's no need for it to mutate to get worse or better transmitter. And it's, it's it's a pretty well evolved virus uh, as it is now. Everything that had to be done was done before we we noticed it. Sure. I mean, what I would say is, so mutation will continue to happen for sure. But but it's a it's sort of a probabilities game, right? Where um, and the chances of something going sort of really sideways here in terms of virulence, as you're saying, is it, the probability is super low. Um, but mutation selection happens, and so those will be some other things that we'll try to put into a little bit of context. Um, today, as we sort of talk through some of the the details um, of the virus and the evolution of coronaviruses in general, you don't have any in Utah yet, right? Um, there haven't. I don't think there have been any direct cases. There might be. I think there are some Utahns um, who have been. Uh, <laughs> Is that what you call someone from yeah. Utah? Utah. Yeah, just, <laughs> yep. Had an N at the end of it. Yep. Um, where uh, who've been on some of the cruise ships that That's have been quarantined? Yep. Um, and I think, you know, I can't remember if it's a couple, but where, um, where, um, one of the guy, the guy is still stuck, uh, yeah, yeah. overseas and, um, trying to figure out the, the route home and under quarantine, uh, in, in that situation. So, and I don't think it'll be long before, you know, those dots on that, um, the Johns Hopkins, and we'll put that link, um, to that dashboard on the website, or you can find that pretty easily, um, at the TWIV website as well, this week in virology website, right? Yeah. The other the other site that's good is the WHO Corona Situation Reports mm, mm, come out every day with a, a, a summary. And there they have the what we call an epi curve, which is the number of cases per day, mm-hmm. right? And if you look at the China epi curve, you see uh you know, it's it's uh it's gone down. It's no longer increasing. But if you look at the cases outside of China, it's going up. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too that I think must be on the radar 
of a lot of public fo- health folks right now is that so China has taken some pretty extreme measures right in terms of yeah, uh, kind have. of locking down cities, uh, limiting transportation, and as the virus sort of um, pokes up in other places that have sort of different cultural styles, different governments, you know, control sort of scenarios in place, that that will be almost like natural experiments kind of across the globe um, uh, unfolding in the in the weeks ahead, I would say. Yeah, some countries are not willing to restrict travel at all, like China did. I mean, they mm-hmm. had mm-hmm. to because it started there and it was going to, I mean, as it is, 80,000 cases, right? That's That's a lot. And that's an underestimate, most likely. (laughs) Yeah, especially given that um, figure that you mentioned before, Vincent. So the 80% of uh, very low or no symptoms, right? Yeah, Yeah, I mean, many people are not even getting diagnosed because they feel fine and they have just a very mild infection. And maybe later when we do serological surveys, we'll see the extent to which the Chinese population has been infected. Yeah, I'm sure that once this is over, and and by the way, it will end, Mm -hmm. uh, what we have here at least in the Northeast, and where we are, you are too, uh, the warm weather is coming. Mm-hmm. And we know for influenza and common cold viruses, that is the end of those seasons. And so it could very well be that, uh, you know, before this gets started, we are coming on to March. Typically, the flu season is over by May. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It could be weather limited and then... Uh, yeah, seasonal dynamics as well. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, so maybe we should dig in and we'll, okay. again, we'll try to do a um, kind of an evolutionary focus as much as we can. But so I guess the first question is just a little bit of background and even, um, you know, what's the name of this virus? So that's been sort of a, a changing uh, situation as well. So rem- can you remind our listeners, Vincent, uh, what the current sort of nomenclature is on this one? Well, <laughs> you know, when the <laughs> virus was first identified, yeah. Uh, they called it 2019-NCOV, right? 2019 new corona uh, virus. And then uh, WHO decided to call the disease something different from the actual virus. The disease is called COVID-19, coronavirus infectious disease, and 19 is for the year, last year when we, we first saw it. <laughs> mm-hmm. However, they, they decided that... Uh, the name should be SARS-CoV-2 of the virus itself. So the virus and the disease have two different names, which mm. is a little weird because SARS coronavirus, the one that came out in 2003, it's just SARS is the disease, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and it's embedded in the name of the virus, which I think is perfect, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so SARS-CoV-2, this is almost like SARS 2.0, if yeah, you right. wish. Version 2.0, right. <laughs> so sars CoV-2 would be perfect for both, but uh, for some reason, WHO decided to name the disease separately. And, you know, COVID is very generic. Infectious disease, what is that? Could be anything, right? I see. Yeah, right. Yep. I see you have an article here from The Lancet, which is uh, a distinct name is needed for the new coronavirus. uh, What's their take there? Yeah, so this is in, you know, the SARS will obviously be a um, a really useful comparison point here as we kind of think about some of the evolutionary implications. But um, I was reading this and uh, this Lancet piece that came across. And so they're arguing that, you know, calling this SARS version 2.0 or CoV-2 yeah. um, is, as we're kind of, um, you know, is a bit confusing. And so they are proposing HCoV-19-19, so for human coronavirus-19. Um, I doubt, I think probably the horse is out of the barn and the naming is done. Plus, doesn't this happen? Is it, is it the ICTV? Is that the main platform that sort of um, endorses viral names? Uh, yeah, or- they would be the final approver. So this, these individuals who uh, wrote this article, uh, they cannot name the no. virus. They could suggest names, but the ICTV is the one in the end. They have a big committee who votes on it and so forth. Yeah. In fact, the the... Uh, I'm not sure the SARS virus name may be a suggestion of the ICTV. I Mm -hmm. think they meant that to be everything, but then WHO stepped in and put in COVID-19. So, Yeah. Yep. So anyway, the point of the, in this Lancet piece, and we'll put up the link, is that human coronavirus 19, so first of all, it it links it to the disease, the COVID-19. So they both end in 19, which uh, links it by the date. And then, um, as we'll discuss in a bit more detail, um, this currently circulating coronavirus is quite a bit different than SARS. 
And so uh, the, the SARS coronavirus one. And so perhaps even from a sort of like a biological standpoint that that could kind of, um, you know, be a confusing mm. uh, direct link as well. And so HCoV was their suggestion. It probably, I think the like, it's probably too late, too late, but I, you know, that was to me at least seemed like a reasonable alternate suggestion. Well, it's my understanding that the name is not finalized yet. Oh, I see. Yep. So, so, but ICTV will take a while to, to finalize it. Come to it. Yep. That'll be interesting so to see. Stay tuned. But in the meanwhile, we know. Yeah, it is different um, from SARS in many aspects. And I think ICTV will take that into consideration. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see. So then I thought maybe, you know, a little background on coronavirus biology. And this is perfect uh, having you here, Vincent, given you've just been teaching this in your class. So maybe help us out here. What are these coronaviruses? How You know, it's they? funny. Is <laughs> My my virology course mm -hmm. is not is not based on a virus by virus discussion. It's on f function and process, and so we don't really talk about coronaviruses very much because uh, you can explain most of what they do using other iconic viruses. But this year, I've thrown in a few things because I want people to know mm -hmm. a coronavirus. Well, the first thing, the corona doesn't have anything to do with the beer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it has to do with when these viruses were first seen, which isn't too long ago. The mm -hmm. first the first coronas were very mild causing uh, upper respiratory upper respiratory tract viruses like common colds. Mm. Um and there are a couple of those and they have weird names that if you don't like the names of the current <laughs> coronas, you won't like any of those, but they have when they first saw them in an electron microscope, it looked the uh, it was an envelope virus, and they have glycoproteins in the envelope, and it kind of looked like the corona of the sun. Hmm. And so, uh, I think there's corona means something in Latin too, right? Yeah, uh, crown. Crown. It looks like a crown. That's another way. To, I've heard both stories. So the crown is one naming, and the other is the corona of the sun. But if you look at the EMs, they do kind of look crown like, but a crown isn't circular right it's it's different so yeah right that's and where coronavirus symmetric. comes from okay yeah and it's a family so coronaviridae is a family of similar viruses there's a there, there are viruses of other animals that are related uh and are taxonomically taxonomically in a in a in an order basically mm -hmm. of a collection of families but uh, mm -hmm. you know many other animals get coronavirus infection so they're envelope viruses they have an rna genome and it's unusual because it's very long. It's, it has the longest known RNA genome. Yeah, wow. The coronas uh, go from 27 to 34 KB. Hmm. The current one, the, the new one, is 29,000 bases and change. But the coronaviruses, they're not coronas, they're, they're nidoviruses, which is a related family in the same order, mm -hmm. um, can be up to 44 KB. <laughs> <laughs> they have been found in uh, wow. mollusks and uh, in um, uh, what's the other organism that they've been from? mollusks and worms in C. elegans, I believe. Yeah, interesting. Kind of the super tankers of the RNA virus. Really big. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, as, along with that, so they're positive stranded, which means that the genome is translated directly in the cell. So there's hmm. there's no RNA polymerase in the particle. Mm -hmm. Although one has to be synthesized in the cell in order to make more genomes, mm -hmm. but the genomes are unusual in that they're coated with with a nucleocapsid protein, hmm. and typically plus strand RNA genomes are not. There are two exceptions: the coronaviruses and the retroviruses. And hmm. mm -hmm. the retroviruses they're also unusual because they have a enzyme in the particle reverse transcriptase, and the coronas just have a protein, probably because it's so big, and I think it stabilizes the genome physically. I see, and that. Uh, potentially allows to get to that large genome size to maintain it. Yeah, I think that's part of it. The other is that these hmm. viral genomes encode a proofreading enzyme. Right. Which this is, is the unique uh, among RNA viruses, really. Hmm. And it, it corrects errors. Most RNA-dependent RNA polymerases do not have any correction function as DNA-dependent DNA polymerases do. And the idea is that these coronavirus and related virus genomes can get so big because they encode an error-correcting protein. If you take that out of the genome, which you can do mm -hmm. by engineering, mm -hmm. uh, the, the viruses uh, 
go into mutational decline. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess compared to other RNA viruses then would is the point mutation rate lower in coronaviruses because they have that proofreading capacity? I think it's on the same order. Um just but, because it's longer that you would need to yeah, have more I, proofreading I to avoid the you know yeah, 1 yeah, in 10,000 yeah. to 100,000 basis a typical RNA polymerase error rate. Mm -hmm. And I think um your the genome size is limited with that. So this one can go above that with uh, that rate because of the error correction. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, and that's a, it raises interest, interesting point that mutational decay. So this notion that for viruses that you know there's a, there's this sort of threshold between where uh, mutation rates are generally high enough that you're generate as a population you're generating this mutational diversity um, and that might lead to the ability to spread or to deal with the the immune systems of uh, uh, hosts reservoir hosts or new hosts where at mm. the same time, if you go beyond that threshold into either mutational decay or sometimes called error catastrophe past that threshold, yeah. that the mutation rates get high enough, or if it's in the context of a longer genome like this, where you start to accumulate so many deleterious mutations that the population just can't sustain itself. And that's been a really interesting concept, that the error catastrophe threshold for a lot of um, evolutionary virology in the last decade or so, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, and then people would like to make drugs that make viruses mutate even more and wipe themselves out, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. So, and then so certainly point mutations going on here, but what's known for coronaviruses about other mutational mechanisms, um, sort of the fuel of evolution potentially? So things like recombination, insertion, deletion. What, what's known about that? For sure, these these viruses recombine uh, pro prolifically. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. Prolifically, yeah, 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 a lot. They're, yep. <laughs> pro, they're prolificate. I think prolificate is a word, isn't it? I think it is. Yep. Yeah, uh, they're prolificate recombiners. Uh huh. Pro. I have to look it up. Prolif. Fligate. No, it's not showing up in my. Profligate is something else. Right. That's okay. wasteful. Yeah. They do recombine. Yes, the two two different coronas can infect the cell, and they can exchange pieces of their RNA, mm -hmm. and you can have new sequences inserted. You can have. <laughs> deletions one of the very interesting deletions when this when this virus started circulating back in uh, December mm -hmm. I, re I reminded me of a paper that was published last year from Christian Drosten's group in Germany mm. in the emergence of SARS which started in early 2003 about midway through the epidemic a variant emerged that was deleted in one of the small open reading frames mm -hmm. encoded in the genome. Hmm. And this is called ORF8 because no one knows what the encoded protein does. But uh, the it was originally thought that maybe this is making the virus more virulent. Mm -hmm. Well, when they studied it in the cells and in uh, animals, it turns out it actually reduces the replication and the virulence of the virus. Right? Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. And and Drosten's logic is that this may allow the virus to prolong transmission from a host rather than making it very sick and immobilized. It could, and, and, he, and he cited a few other examples of similar mutations that have arisen in outbreaks like Ebola and uh, MERS, even that actually reduce virulence so that transmission is more effective. So I asked him immediately. And he said, yes, that, that ORF is still in the SARS-2 genome. I see, and I see. Yeah. It's still there to this day, so it's not going anywhere. It would have been interesting if it had gone away, right? But it is still, as I said, it's, very, uh, it's a very mild infection to begin with. SARS is unusual because, and this Ralph Barrick told us uh, on Twitter a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. you get very sick and you tend to go to the hospital. Over 50% of the people uh, went in the hospital, and the transmission occurs at the peak of disease for SARS. So, yep, yep. Um, it makes sense there that it would kind of back off a bit, but this one is already pretty mild. So, so anyway, long answer to your question is these viruses do undergo extensive recombination. They can acquire and lose sequences from coronas and, and theoretically from other RNAs as well. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And so that um, ORF8 or open reading frame 8 um, 
kind of an interesting prediction, right? That maybe it will stick around because of what you were just saying, that the virus is already kind of at a, a lower virulence yeah. compared to some of the others, but that's something we can kind of keep an eye on. And one of the, one of the really interesting things, and we'll get kind of into the weeds a little bit more about this um, in a few minutes, but so, you know, the, the monitoring that's going on here in this kind of new era of molecular epidemiology and real-time genome sequencing um, really gives us a peek under the hood of these viruses in a way that is pretty, you know, exciting and fascinating to be able to, as we, you know, learn about the biology of it, to mm -hmm. actually see in real time how the virus might um, behave in terms of mutation yeah. and selection. Yeah. So, yep. So anyway, so getting back to the corona and those spikes, so I was just looking at a, um, you know, an image, an EM electron micrograph uh, of that. And I can see the point. So the spikes are really um, dramatic, uh, s uh, sticking out from the surface of the virus. And so maybe um, help, let's fill in some details here. What is the spike protein? What does it do? Well, the spike is a name we give uh, proteins in, in viral membranes. The viral membrane is always coming from the host cell. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't have any proteins in it, wouldn't be able to do anything, most likely. Not very efficiently anyway. So virus genomes encode proteins that are stuck in the envelope or membrane. Mm -hmm. And we call them spikes because when we first looked at them in the electron microscope, they kind of looked like spikes. And, you know, the, I think among the first viruses was influenza virus where it really looks spiky. Mm -hmm. The coronas are, are different because they have more of a globular head, right? Mm -hmm. it, it gives you that striking crown-like look. Yeah. So that's what the spike is. It's a viral protein and this is really important for attaching to host cells i see in fact that it contains what we call the receptor binding domain mm -hmm. it's actually a domain of the protein which you can separate from the rest of the spike and it will bind uh, the receptor and this is really important for infecting and so it determines the host range what kind of animals the viruses are going to infect so a lot of work has has circled around these spike glycoproteins so this is sort of the front lines in a sense of as the virus is uh, out in the environment, potentially finding uh, a, a new place to uh, attach, fuse, and then uh, even eventually replicate. So, Yeah. I mean, uh, this and, will determine and, whether the cor coronavirus remains in a bat uh -huh. or if it can infect a different kind of cell. And, you know, in a way, a lot of this is random. The, as you said before, the the genome is mutating, and so... Just randomly, spikes will arise that have potentially a different, uh, can bind a different receptor. And of course, if they stay in bats, nothing happens. But if yeah. they should encounter a human, <laughs> they might be able to infect them. Yeah. And almost every point of contact maybe is like a new experiment in a sense, right? You're drawing from these, mm -hmm. these viruses in general travel in pretty large packs. And so you have at the population level, the potential to have all this diversification, as you mentioned on the spike in, um, in particular, that then could mean the difference between making that recognition of a receptor on a potential new host cell. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. And so- I mean, the, the, the thing about bats, in every country, they're full of viruses of all different sorts. There's something unique about them in that they're able to tolerate, without being ill, a lot of different viruses. So they are big sources. And you know, at, at one point in human evolution, we didn't encounter bats all that much, I guess. Mm -hmm. And if we did, I'm sure some hunter-gatherer societies, you know, tried to eat them. Mm -hmm. But they were small. They were 100 people in a group. And if so, they got a virus from a bat that didn't go very far. Yeah. <laughs> and there were no newspapers or internet to report it. <laughs> <laughs> but today right. we have billions of people on the planet and a lot of contact with bats, not just in China, but, Correct. you know, other countries. And so we get their viruses. We do, we do get other animal viruses. We get... Um, you know, we get viruses from camels, MERS, corona. We get viruses from mice, hantaviruses, mm -hmm. yeah, and there yeah. are many others. But yeah. uh, the bats have more. I think Lin Fa Wa said, Lin Fa Wang said this at ASV last year. Bats have mm -hmm. harbor more viruses than any other species on the planet. Yeah, it's interesting. And then you know, th again, maybe from an evolutionary perspective, thinking about um, just the evolutionary distance between bats and humans. So we share a common ancestor um, as mammals, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty uh, distant, uh, you know, common ancestry. And so that somehow uh, alternate hypothesis, or maybe not mutually exclusive, but another hypothesis for why um, bats have kind of become 
the ground zero for a lot of uh, virus spillover events. Are we just are have our immune systems diverged to a point where there's this sort of ability for the viruses still to be close enough that they might recognize something in common about the receptors on our cells, but still different enough that the viruses, as they move or potentially spill over, actually have a pretty drastic clinical phenotype. They're not matched for the the um, human host compared to the bat host. And how much of that then leads to the virulence you see or the the really severe symptoms? Yeah, in some I of mean, the, that's a good yeah. point because the physiology of bats and humans are very different because they fly and they have to deal with the oxidative radicals made by flying. Mm-hmm. And I think that's partly why the thought is that that's partly why they can tolerate virus infections. And so when we acquire one of their viruses, initially it's rather severe because, well, first of all, we have no immunity to it whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. also it hasn't been a, it hasn't had time to adapt. So if you look at the uh, common cold-causing coronaviruses, which came into humans a long time ago, mm. many of them from bats, they're mild. And maybe they weren't when they first started or, with, mm. you know. Yeah. So yep. this one is pretty mild, but, you know, 20% of infections are serious. And it could be that in, I don't know, a few thousand years, they'll all be mild. Nobody pays attention to the other coronaviruses because they are just completely benign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, and I think that's one of the bigger points, actually, of of thinking about this kind of from a little more of an evolutionary perspective is how much of this is, it's all the things that we don't see that are sort of the important details or the context for kind of thinking about this. Yeah. And so, yeah, those exact points. So one more thing, Nels, is that, yeah. so the key here is that this virus is now transmitting human to human very efficiently, right? Mm. Uh-huh. Ebola never does that. Ebola virus goes, you know, the biggest was 20,000 people in West Africa. It was highly unusual for a variety of reasons, but most Ebola chains of infection are really short. Right. And the virus spills over again from a bat. So it never becomes a human virus. So it never has a chance to evolve and become benign over the years. Mm -hmm. The only way you can do that is to transmit in long chains of human infections. And, you know, HIV only came over into people in maybe 1920. And so that's got a way to go. But maybe it could be in a thousand. I don't know how many years it takes, 2,000 years, 3,000. Maybe it's a benign infection by then. Who knows? No, interesting thought experiment. And depending on how many, yeah, as these sort of coronavirus exposures continue um, from other coronaviruses, right? The the reservoir that's becoming increasingly clear in bat populations. I think that's a really interesting, a really interesting question. Well, lots of people are studying that, as you know. Absolutely. They go into bat caves and sample them for viruses, not just in China but in Africa and Asia, because each continent has its own collection of uh, bats and their viruses and you know those here in new york city there's, a, there's an organization called the eco health alliance and mm-hmm. peter dashak is the head of that and they fund expeditions in china that have found some of these bat sars like coronaviruses and and one of them is the closest to the current virus in terms of genome sequence yeah wow Bat, Nails, would you go in, a, in an expedition and, and collect bats and sample them? <laughs> yeah, I would. Actually, <laughs> uh, we're and we're so we're not thinking about viruses of bats, but I think I've told you maybe offline a few times we we are getting more interested in bat uh, microbiology. Um, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. stay tuned. We I think in a few weeks we might go on record on the bioarchive with what, sort of our first foray cool. into thinking about some bat um, interactions with infectious microbes that will take us into the bacterial world. So obviously not nearly as kind of um, in the news or of um, concern to folks, but uh, I think bats are a fascinating system um, kind of for the reasons we've already been discussing. But so Vincent, we've been talking a little bit about receptors sort of in general for virus um, kind of moving between hosts, et cetera. But what is, what are some of the specifics here in terms of the viruses at play or sorry, the receptors at play for SARS coronavirus two? Well, the, the receptor for the original SARS Coronavirus was a is a cell surface protein called angiotensin converting enzyme two, mm-hmm. and um, what's it's an enzyme. It has it's which is unusual for a virus receptor. I don't know a lot that are actually enzymes, and I don't know that the enzymatic activity has a lot to do because I'm pretty sure the virus spike binds at a place away from the active site. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because. MERS coronavirus, the receptor is dipeptidyl peptidase 4, which is another cell surface enzyme. Hmm. <laughs> so there's something about cell surface enzymes that 
it's attractive to these viruses. So yeah. the new human corona, very early on in January, was shown to also bind ACE2 and get in cells via that interaction. Okay. In fact, uh, the, the first paper where they described the isolation of virus and the total genome sequence came out of the Wuhan, Wuhan laboratory. Beautiful paper. You know, they got some uh, aspirate from a patient, a, a isolated virus and sequenced the entire genome. Uh, and then they took the virus and they threw it on cells that initially did not have ACE2. And then they introduced ACE2 of hu- different species into those cells. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I think they did human and bat and rodent and others. I can't remember, but the human and the bat ACE2 bound and brought in the new coronavirus, but the rodent did not. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Which would mean that you can't just infect mice and have a model, right? You've got to do something else. So you have to change it. Yeah. Yep. So, and this is um, Zhang Li Shi's lab, right? Over in Wuhan. And, yes. and yeah. it's not her first rodeo when it comes to coronaviruses. So, I was doing a little bit of background here and found a really cool paper from a couple of years ago in PLOS Pathogens. So this is uh, exactly what you were describing um, a few minutes ago. So as folks are kind of sampling bat bats in the environment, doing swabs, um, both I think kind of respiratory swabs, so in the back of the throat, um, and then also, um, you know, uh, kind of fecal swabs, mm-hmm. all of these samples and pulling out a, a massive diversity of coronaviruses, I think into the hundreds. And so in this paper from the she lab, they start to do some sequence comparisons, right? And actually highlight the spike gene as the place where you see the most uh, diversity, genetic diversity mm-hmm. across the entire genome. And I think what's cool about this from an evolutionary standpoint is so other work, um, one of our sort of science buddies, Sarah Sawyer at um, Colorado, a few years ago, she had a cool paper in, I think, Journal of Virology. This is with um, Ann Demogenes, who is a former postdoc in Sarah's lab. Sarah, by the way, has been on Tuivo, um, episode five. We were talking about um, bats, but with Ebola virus. Um, and uh, Kartik Chandran, um, a friend from Albert Einstein, was in on that conversation as well, a cool study, the collaboration they had. Um, but also with Mike uh, Farzan, so a really well-known um, sort of virus structural biologist. They were looking at ACE2, that um, receptor that you've been mentioning, the angiotensin converting enzyme, and pointed out that it is under uh, positive selection in bats in particular, meaning that there's rapid evolution of that receptor. And so given all of that genetic diversity that the she lab is describing in the spike gene that encodes the spike that recognizes the receptor, and then all of the diversity on the receptor side among bats of ACE2, this would suggest something like one of these kind of genetic conflicts or almost like molecular arms races that we sometimes have talked about on Twivo that sort of um, might be kind of the hot zone um, for kind of evolution to be uh, uh, litigated or litigating evolution almost in a sense for whether or not a virus will recognize a receptor or if there are variants in now the host population that have mutations that make the receptor invisible to the virus, theory would predict that those ones, those folks won't get infected. They won't suffer some of the consequences um, over kind of evolutionary time, such that those um, individuals will have the most kids, meaning that 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 now you start to select in the host population, actually, for, in this case, bat populations, for ones that have mutations that might be less vulnerable to some of the coronaviruses they're seeing at the time. Mm-hmm. But then the process would just continue, right? So then, sure, yeah. So we had Ruben Harris here two weeks ago, mm-hmm. and he works on Apobex, yeah. cytidine deaminases, cellular proteins that are antiviral, mm-hmm. right? Um, and w- what is interesting is that they're, Many apobec genes in different species. We have a whole bunch, but the species. What do you think, Nels, is the species with the most apobec genes on the planet that we know of? <laughs> Ooh, g- g- good question. I'm going to go with fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, bats. <laughs> oh, bats. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Now, what's interesting there is that apobecs are uh, very active against um, retroviruses because they have a DNA intermediate, right? And and the enzyme traditionally is known to work on DNA, and they work against herpes viruses of different sorts. So this, having a lot of apobex in bats would imply that they, and since bats have mostly RNA viruses in them, would imply that they're also working against um, 
RNA viruses as well. So they've they've expanded over the years in number the yeah. the apobec genes in response to you know assaults from RNA viruses. Yeah, really interesting. And that's actually potentially two forms of sort of evolutionary mechanism. So one is like the massive duplication of a gene family and then special mm-hmm. like kind of new functions or specialization as you're outlining there. And then another cool thing about the apobex, so certainly in pri- among primates, and this is also work that um, Sarah Sawyer was doing um, as a postdoc in Harmeet Malik's lab, was some of the first observations of positive selection or recurrent positive selection, these kind of arms race yeah. scenarios among the apobex. And in that case, we think it's because the viruses encode sort of outright inhibitors of the apobex. And so that kind of sets off this cat and mouse game to avoid the inhibitor uh, on the host in sort of a similar evolutionary scenario. Now, is the uh, the ACE two positive selection in bats is that at at uh, coronavirus spike binding residues? It is, yeah. And so that was the cool thing about that paper from um, Anne, Mike, and Sarah from a few years ago. Journal worth checking out in Journal of Virology. I think it's also worth noting that uh, among primates, humans included, there's not positive selection at ACE two. It where the ACE two receptor or um, surface protein, surface enzyme, is relatively stable. And so in that sense, there's not a lot of standing diversity like in human populations. So, um, I mean, so first of all, as we've been saying, it's from an evolutionary standpoint, it's very unlikely that this virus is going to cause the kind of selective sweep that, we, that we're inferring mm-hmm. from these mm-hmm. sort of yeah. really ancient events. And so just to kind of put in a little context, um, but even if it was, if we had no medical interventions, if this thing just was like slicing through populations, um, at least currently, there's not a lot of known, perhaps there's some rare variants out there, but there haven't been sort of in our evolutionary past, at least from sort of a 30 million year view, mm-hmm. any kind of dust ups that might suggest that there's been a, a, a massive pandemic that swept through the population. It mm-hmm. looks like it's right. been pretty quiet in the last 30 to 50 million years. The receptor hasn't been selected for mutations that might avoid past uh, conflicts with coronaviruses or similar ancient viruses. And I would say, given the really not severe nature of coronaviruses in humans, that it's not likely that they're going to uh, be positively select certain genotypes, right? No, I, yeah, that's right. And in fact, I'd say in some ways, since kind of medical interventions have come online in the last couple of hundred years, um, the human population, we've sort of put our finger on the scale of sort of... Um, the old style of these kind of arms races where mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, basically, you know, they could, the, the viruses would just run through populations until they sort of burn themselves out. Um, now with the advent of vaccines, uh, other just behavioral modifications, a lot of the public health sort of things that we're seeing uh, happening in real time here. Um, we have all kinds of strategies outside of just sort of old fashioned natural selection of random mutation and selection to, to sort of um, tip the balance in the favor of uh, our population. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, really interesting um, biology here, but so to kind of zoom in a little bit more closely to the SARS coronavirus two, you put up this really cool um, paper or sort of report called the proximal origin of SARS CoV. It's on a website called virological. What's, I mean, you give us a little background on this. So Virological is a is a website maintained by Andrew Rambo, mm-hmm. a uh, evolutionary biologist, focuses mm-hmm. a lot on viruses, uh, I believe in the Netherlands and and you can uh, he posts commentaries such as these. So this is not a paper, a peer reviewed paper or, or anything of the sort, but it's a, kind of an opinion. Mm-hmm. And um he has other uh, he so he also hosts a lot of the the data you can see real time sequencing results um, uh, at a website, which is basically his doing. Yep. And there are other there are other papers there as well, looking at the data. Um, so this proximal origin was a commentary put up uh, two weeks ago, I guess, about where the virus came from, because there was a lot of discussion in in the um, not just in non scientists, but scientists also were wondering. Is it possible that this came out of a lab? And yeah. so they put this together to kind of dispel those hypotheses. Yeah. Yeah. I was mentioning, so when I was at the barber shop this last weekend, that um, topic came up where um, the guy who was cutting my hair said he'd heard, he'd read something online or heard, you know, a podcast about um, 
the bottles of Lysol said that they're effective against coronavirus and that that was sort of <laughs> disturbing because it's like, well, how did they know if this thing just happened a couple of weeks ago? Uh, yeah, right, as if yeah. there was some conspiracy here where Lysol was in with sort of some, um, you know, villains, super villains or something to, to cause this thing. And, um, you know, so we had, actually, we had a really fun conversation and, um, kind of high level conversation about the fact that SARS is also coronavirus. And so this has been on the radar. That's probably, you know, like the first recent incursion, um, uh, before those sort of formative events, I think it was back in the 1950s, there were some other coronaviruses that sort of smoldered up or, or kind of or founded the field. But anyway, that exactly that idea that mm -hmm. this is a natural, um, emerging virus versus something that, you know, mad scientists have been developing in the laboratory. And so, um, yeah, so the lead author here, on this um, kind of short note, uh, research note, is Christian Anderson, who's at the Scripps um, in, uh, Institute in San Diego. Um, I met Christian a few years ago in San Diego. We had a, a beer, a, a really fun, nice guy, um, and kind of kicked around some ideas and um, evolutionary virology a little bit. So he trained in Party Sabeti's group at Harvard. It's a really mm -hmm. big, great lab, kind of on the forefront of high-throughput sequencing kind of charting um, virus diversity and evolution in real time. And Christian's been involved in some projects like he, um, the, as Ebola was emerging a few years ago, Lassa virus is another one. Um, he's been involved in some of these real time studies, kind of molecular epidemiology with West Nile virus as well. And so um, I think really um, thoughtful guy who's sort of mixing the epidemiology with the biology um, and virology in, in a, a really great way. Also kind of a dream team. So you mentioned Andrew um, Rambo, who's uh, mm -hmm. runs virological.org, also a co-author, Ian Lipkin, um, mm -hmm. someone from your neighborhood there. Um, Eddie Holmes, who's um, really a well-known and um, sort of at the forefront of uh of virus evolution in real time as well. And so kind of, I think as Eddie used to call the all-star team <laughs> mm -hmm. of, uh, of sort of real time virus evolution. And um, yeah. So what's interesting here, right. Is they, they focused on, so to get at that question of, is this a natural virus? Is this, they just do some sequence comparisons as they, these things are coming off um, of the clinical samples as, as people are, um, very quickly going from a clinical case to a virus genome, which then you can kind of compare and contrast to um, virologists in real time doing, you know, some, some real wet bench work in terms of binding assays, cell infections to try to put together a picture of what's going on here. And so I guess they focused on the um, spike gene sequence. So that really rapidly evolving part of the genome that was already known from some of the work from the she lab and others for coronaviruses. Um, and then they note that in binding assays in, to human ACE2 receptor, that um, so that there's this receptor binding domain, um, and there's a great figure here, figure one, um, that actually zooms in. So it shows kind of the map of the whole virus from nucleotide one to about twenty nine thousand, like just in change, just like you were saying a few minutes ago. And then you can, can kind of zoom into the spike gene, which is just near the end of the genome, uh, about runs for about 2,000 base pairs, maybe 3,000 base pairs, actually. Um, and then zoom in again at the receptor binding domain. And so this is just maybe, what is it, 150 nucleotides, so the codons that encode the amino acids. And then they're doing a five-way comparison or six-way comparison between the SARS coronavirus 2 some of the bat coronaviruses and remind us, Vincent. So there's these bat viruses look almost identical. Is that true to this one that's circulating in human? How does that, how does that look? So there is one, there's one bat isolate from 2013. Okay. From a cave in Yunnan. And that genome is 96% identical to the SARS CoV-2. So it is the closest virus to the currently circulating human virus, much closer than SARS isolates from 2003. And and the, the interesting thing there is that when the when the authors in Wuhan originally isolated virus from the first patients and they sequenced it, you know they blasted it against all the known sequences, mm -hmm. and they pulled out a, a short fragment from a bat genome, but that was incomplete. It was only a small piece of PCR product that from that 2013 isolate. So they apparently had some 
uh, or f- fecal material from the bat still in the freezer, and they sequenced the whole genome from it. Oh, wow, that's cool. Because they did not have that sequence or that virus, um, and which I always used as a, you know, as a way of saying it couldn't have been made because they didn't have the virus to make the human virus from. But even yeah, yep. if they did, it's different enough so that it's not the progenitor of the human virus. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So we're six years away in time. Yes. Different species. And then when, and this is where I think the, you know, kind of rubber hits the road here. So when you look at that receptor binding domain and they show a stretch of about maybe a hundred or I don't know, 70 amino acids. Mm-hmm. And it's basically a really like all of those um, amino acids line up with that, with the, um, with that bat coronavirus, um, except in, uh, they point out six boxes. So these are the actual amino acids that make contact with right. ACE2, right? right? And here, five out of six are actually different substitutions. Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of what undergirds your point that this, you know, is uh, sort of new on the biological scene in a sense. Right. Those these, those five of six on the human virus are different from the from the bat. Yeah. And so and so then the question is, you know. If, from kind of the mad scientist hypothesis, you just wouldn't have known to pick those those um, that combination of five residues. And remember, there are what is it, twenty one different amino acids. And so when you multiply or take twenty one to the fifth, the number of combinations that you would have to come up with is just um, you know not feasible from an engineering standpoint. The bad virus presumably would not be able to attach to human ACE two. We don't exactly. actually know that, but the human has now gotten better, but it's not what you would predict. So we have a lot of RBD sequences that uh, bind to ACE2, and they have used that to make a consensus, and this doesn't fit the consensus. That's right. If you were going to make a virus, say you wanted to convert the, the bat virus of 2013 into a human virus, you wouldn't put the receptor binding domain sequence that's in the human virus because that was apparently selected in nature by a human like ACE2. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, you would have right. put in a different optimal sequence that's predicted from all the computational analysis, right? Yeah. No, and it illustrates, I think, a really important point. And I think you guys um, kind of kicked this around on TWIV um, the last episode, which is, you know, as human engineers, our kind of reach is pretty modest compared to sort of the natural experiments that viruses are doing all the yeah. time. Yeah. They're sure. just by random mutation and selection. And just hitting those combinations again and again invisibly, because we're you know most of these are failed experiments where you, there isn't that, that combination of amino acids does not confer recognition on the receptor, and so those viruses just fade away. Um, but then you've got these rare cases where it actually works, and this is what we're kind of dealing with now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but so there is a an interesting match here, though, and I think this is what you're getting at. So if you again focus in on those um, six amino acids that are sort of from biochemical structural analysis show that direct connection between spike protein and host receptor. Um, There is a match with a a pretty, not as closely related to the bat coronaviruses, but a virus that was um, recently discovered in pangolins. Mm -hmm. So first a little background, I think most folks have probably actually heard this by now, but pangolins are these just absolutely adorable <laughs> um, mammals, scaly mammals, kind of part anteater, part armadillo somehow, um, really charismatic. And also kind of, uh, you know, one of those just heartbreaking scenarios where the um, wildlife trade for, I think, Chinese traditional medicine has really taken a, a huge hit yeah. and toll on the pangolin population. So c- coming on as, uh, you know, potentially endangered species before too long. Um, But this was really kind of um, and sort of came up a few weeks ago. And I think this sort of helps to put it into some context with this idea that this could, and this is um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the coronaviruses over the last, um, the big ones, so MERS and SARS over the last 15 or 20 years have had this um, proposed kind of host progression where you go from a bat virus. And that's very consistent with the, with the similarity to all of the recently sampled coronaviruses from bats, but then they go through another intermediate host, which for SARS was that um, civet cats. Is that yeah, correct? It seemed to be a civet, yeah. And then for MERS, as I think you just said, the camels. Yeah. Um, 
And so this kind of immediately put on the radar the possibility that you went from bats, given the really high 96, 97% nucleotide identity across the entire um, 29,000 plus base pairs um, to the pangolin. Now the pangolin overall um, coronaviruses that have been sampled, I think, aren't they more like 95% or 94% identical? So they're not as close of a match. Yeah. However, at this location, the receptor binding domain, six out of six. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's really wild. And then when you actually, I just took a moment to look closer at that alignment and there's actually 10 out of 10. Mm-hmm. So there, uh, uh, if you compare that to the bat, so there's um, six out of six for the binding domain, uh, uh, the specific six residues. But then if you just go through the top three in this comparison to figure one and you ask what's different between the human SARS coronavirus two um, and, and the bat, the very closest bat, there are four more residues that are perfect matches with pangolin, but different from the bat. Mm-hmm. And so I think what that might at least suggest as a viable hypothesis is that there's a recombination event here that a portion of the virus genome we'd have, it'd be better perhaps to look at the nucleic acids, um, which you get three characters instead of one, since there's three nucleic mm-hmm. acids per mm-hmm. codon, um, for one amino acid. But if that holds up for the nucleic acids, then you could, um, suggest or propose that a portion of a pangolin coronavirus somehow recombined with a bat coronavirus to give you this pattern where, you know, for 29,000 base pairs, it mostly looks like bat, but in this little stretch, it almost looks exactly like a pangolin. I think you could um, potentially explain that through recombination. I think though it it doesn't necessarily have to be the pang, the pangolin coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It could have been another animal and, Part of the reason point, I yeah. think that is because the the sequences they got were from pang, illegally imported pangolins from Malaysia that they were in the south of China in Guangzhou, right? Which is very far from where this this outbreak has occurred. What I think is the key here is that it shows that animals that have human ACE like two can select for this particular RBD sequence that looks like a virus that can infect people, right? Oh yeah, no, absolute. And so I think to kind of distinguish between these ideas, what would be really useful is a lot more pangolin virus uh, sampling. And so yeah, and others too, yeah. other animals too, right? Agreed, <laughs> absolute. No, of course, yep. And you know, some folks have said, I think in the um, or and it's uh, come up that you know, in some sense, maybe. So the pangolin idea. So certainly, because so much of the sequence is different, and we'll talk about um, some bigger phylogenetic trees in a moment. Um, that that was sort of maybe a false alarm for this being a similar transmission scheme. Mm -hmm. And that could be right. So when or where recombination happened, what species it happened um, is certainly up in the air. But so, you know, folks are, I think are kind of hoping that, well, if the pangolin is the actual intermediate species, if there is one, that then, you know, this will keep people away from yeah. pangolins. I mean, <laughs> right. I, that would be good. I worry, <laughs> that would be good. I worry, you know, I don't know if it could go the other way too, right? Which is where if people are freaked out by pangolins because they're carrying these viruses, then you start killing them. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it, it makes me. Well, worried. if you don't, but, if you don't smuggle them, they're not going to infect you. Leave them alone, right? Leave them yeah. Alone. No, that, <laughs> that would be an optimistic view. And I think, you know, regardless of viruses, I hope that the pangolins do better, that we, do better by the pangolins. But in any case, having more sampling, um, this is where I would probably prioritize. And and I wouldn't be surprised if folks are sort of um, exploring this uh, more closely. So you'd want to have, yeah, a lot more sampling. You'd want to know things like, so in the seafood market, where um, it's pretty clear that this um, epidemic emerged back in late December, -December, mid-December, were there actually, who was, what, what animals were there? Where did those animals come from? And can we start sampling viruses from there to start to get a full, a, a better picture? For sure. Of what, yeah. What now viruses. I remember when the when we, our first episode on this mm-hmm. virus, uh, Kathy Spindler had a link to a an article which showed all the animals that were sold at the Wuhan seafood market that was mm-hmm. impl- implicated initially. And one, I remember one of them was a pangolin because I I looked at it and I said, I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. So they did sell them there, you know, and wow. I'm sure they're sampling whatever. I, I, I've read that they just, you know, rounded up everything and destroyed it, right? But hopefully someone saved something and can look at it. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. Yep. No, I'd be curious to know. So then, 
you included a tree. We've got we're kind of working off some of our notes here, and you included a a really I think useful phylogenetic tree um, that shows some of the um, this is before the new name. So it used to, as you pointed out, it used to be called 2019 novel coronavirus or NCOV, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but now so the SARS coronavirus two version two point has some samples of that uh, about half a dozen or more. And then it's comparing it to other coronaviruses in some of the samples from bats and pangolins, actually. And so, where actually, where is this tree from? Do you remember the source? This is from one of the pangolin. It's it's a manuscript on BioArchive. I think there are five or six pangolin manu- coronavirus manuscripts on BioArchive. Oh, wow. And this yep. is from one where they had uh, complete sequences that I thought was interesting because it has the Wuhan coronavirus, too. It has... Um, the the rat it's not rat sorry it's the 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 bat isolate it's called R A T G thirteen twenty thirteen mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. Yunnan and it has um, the the uh, pangolin isolates Manus javanica and you can see how close they are to uh, the 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 human viruses are close to the bat sequence and the pangolin's a little little bit more distant right yep no that's right and so that's and that you know is also consistent with the overall um, just blast alignment. Yeah. Um, file jack trees can have different um, sort of arrangements than just the blast searches. But yeah, this very clearly shows that if, when you consider the whole, entire virus sequence, um, that, that the bat coronavirus is the closest one. Yeah. Clusters right next to it. So, I mean, the bottom line here is that the, the pangolin viruses are not the immediate progenitor of the, the human virus. We don't actually know what that is. It's not the the bat one either. That's just the closest, right? There's some common ancestor yeah. to those two. That's correct. And what I think will be interesting, um, given that sort of striking um, 10 substitutions in common in the receptor binding domain between this new human virus and um, the pangolin, just that like small sampling of it, whether um, at some point in this kind of tangled history, if there is some recombination. Mm-hmm, for it sure. And it doesn't necessarily mean it was a pangolin. Um, it's also, this is difficult, right, to put the directionality. Did it go from a bat to a pangolin back to a bat? Or, yeah, we don't know. You know, we don't know. It gets complicated. But there are certainly some interesting kind of molecular breadcrumbs or clues here um, to follow up on. So then I also wanted to add kind of one last point on this specific um, uh, paper from Christian Anderson and mm-hmm. others, um, which is or on virological.org, I guess, is they also have this really cool kind of at the top of the list. So there's all of these um, entries, right, of as people are posting and responding. And I, I would really inc- encourage our listeners to go to virological.org and just take a look for yourself. So there's also this great phylodynamic analysis, mm-hmm. and it's up to 129 genomes um, so far. So these are all. Um, taken from uh, patient samples um, as the epidemic has uh, been running for a month or so here, a couple months now. And um, again, sort of putting together a phylogenetic tree and also uh, giving locations. So where are these people, uh, where do they reside? You know, I think you have to be a little bit careful there because, you know, given the travel and uh, so certainly there, it all points to a single emergence, very consistent with the sort of seafood market hypothesis. And what's, you know, now we get a sort of a more narrow view. So that other tree where we're considering bat coronaviruses, these are all in humans. And what you see is actually maybe the, for me, one of the most important features on the tree of recent clinical samples is that there are very few differences. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So this, yeah, it's really interesting. So the scale is of one change is basically like a pretty long stretch on any branch um, of the tree. And so what that means is it's like, this is pretty um, almost like generic evolution of a coronavirus. You have some mutations in the population that probably don't have a massive impact on whether the virus is replicating better or worse. Um, There's just a little bit of variation there. And so at least so far in that amount of sampling, maybe there's a little um, bit of a hint at how unlikely it is that this thing is going to sort of go off the rails. Um, there aren't any, you know, massive indels, recombination events, or all kinds of genetic diversity. It's just sort of smoldering away yep. sure. in terms of a few small point mutations. It's um, it's really good at moving around people. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, I, yeah. I, I often think of when this 
virus arose that was ready to go, was it, there are a couple of possibilities. It could have arisen in an animal and just needed to encounter a human, right? It could have arisen a long time ago. We don't yeah. know. Or it could have arisen by a series of um, infections of people that died out after one or two people, you know, and maybe they didn't get sick or maybe they got pneumonia and nobody noticed because it's winter and there's a lot of pneumonia here and there. But And then maybe in one person it, it sustained a, the mutation that it needed and it took off. We just don't know, right? Yeah. Yep. No, it's really fascinating. And kind of questions like that kind of got me curious about sort of poking around a little bit, thinking about, you know, recent epidemics or pandemics. And so um, as I've just been doing my own kind of armchair uh, research, one of the couple stories that kind of caught my eye that I thought I would just highlight kind of quickly. So one was, um, you know, and we've in, I think a really key point for sort of our Twivo listeners so kind of thinking about some of the um, fundamentals of evolution here and this notion again, that like a lot of virus evolution is everything you can't see. Mm. And so, and it's just like you're saying, right. Is how long was this smoldering or what was the pathway kind of uh, invisible to us? And so there's a great uh, NPR story. We'll put, put up the link on our show notes on um, coronavirus sampling in bats. Um, and then the humans that are in close contact with bats. And so the story was by, uh, Nurit Azenman, and she uh, actually stretched back about three years to, I think, an interview she had done. And this is a fellow, Kevin um, Oliveall from the Eco Health Alliance that you mentioned, mm. headquartered in New York, where they were out. I mean, it's a great story, and there's bats squeaking as they're getting swabbed for <laughs> mm. for, for sampling. Um, but this swabbing that was going on in China, they found 400 coronaviruses just in sort of a, in almost short order, um, figured out that some of them actually can replicate in human cells. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sort of did a, a second leg of the study where they took blood samples from villagers, other humans who are nearby those bat caves where they did their original sampling and, in, and found evidence of coronavirus in the bloodstream of these folks. And these are people that look totally healthy, totally normal, but there are all of these sort of invisible contact points or invisible experiments happening um, all around us. And so anyway, I thought that was a really nice radio piece that just sort of kind of captures um, both how kind of molecular I mean, epidemiology unfolds with some of the evolution that's sort of happening in real time. And I think that that is, makes sense in places where people are contacting bats, right? And I told one of my students yesterday, here in New York City, I doubt anyone has contact with bats. I mean, there are a few in Central Park, but you, you wouldn't expect ever to see a spillover originate in a place like this because we don't have a bat population. But in Africa and in Af in, uh, Asia uh, and other places where there are lots of bats and people are contacting them, they, that's where the spillover would happen, right? Because it's happening, as you say, all the time. Yeah. And then you combine that with sort of the global travel, right? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> the fact that we're all getting together on cruise ships or we're flying – international non-stops and that's really sort of a, a game changer in terms of the ability you know the possibility of pandemics like this i think what it also illustrates for me is just that notion of you know 400 coronaviruses so this idea of you know and i think very rightly we, we can imagine just with sort of the early data points that are coming in from china that this will be um you know uh, obviously a, a, a massively consequential epidemic but there are um Rates of fatalities relatively low compared mm -hmm. to past pandemics, epidemics. Um, also, if we put this in the context with our, um, you know, seasonal flu, I think I was just reading the other day that there's already in the U.S. sort of a hundred pediatric deaths, and we don't even blink an eyelash um, yeah. compared to you know. <laughs> That's right. And so, <laughs> and so um, anyway, it'll probably fall into that category of obviously a. A, pr a pretty consequential event, but will probably smolder down or, or kind of fade out. But since there's so many now, and given that sort of, you know, increasing contacts with humans and wild animals, um, and then the global sort of connectivity and travel, or, you know, are we, and maybe what we'll see is an acceleration. So we had SARS 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had MERS, was that 10 years ago, five years ago. And then will this, are, are we maybe sort of on an increase of new 
coronaviruses, like that this is now starts happening every couple of years, every year or something like that. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's interesting to think about sort of when you step back and, and, and look at some of these patterns that are emerging. I just think as we, as population grows, we invade every corner of the planet. So we have contact with wildlife all the time. Population is huge, which means we have huge numbers of non-immune people to any given zoonotic virus. We have yeah. extensive travel. This is all unprecedented, right, in the history of Earth. And yeah. so these things will happen all the time. And even if China gets rid of all the meat markets, which I doubt they can do, there's going to always be illegal trades. Mm -hmm. uh, people will still have contact with, with bats in some way that could, could lead. So this is not going to stop. The best thing for us to do is to somehow be better prepared. So, you know, figure out how we could make a, a vaccine or an antiviral that would be broadly protective so that yeah. when the next one comes, we're, we're immediately ready. So now we have to scramble to make a vaccine, which is going to take two years. Mm. Okay. People are saying six months dreaming. <laughs> Just forget it. Someone told me today, a company delivered an RNA vaccine to NIH, right? They have the spike sure. probably in RNA. You can inject that. It's immunogenic. Great. They have to do a phase one and they have yeah. to do a phase two, and they have to do a phase three. Phase one is is almost a year. Yeah, yeah. So nothing's happening quickly. If we had broadly acting antivirals that worked for most viruses, you know, we have a couple now that are being tested, but we need more. We don't yeah. do enough work because out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, and I think your point is a really good one, the broad acting nature of that. So if there is some, and you know, I'm totally speculating here, but if there is some truth in the idea that we're going to see more of these things emerge, they're going to be different, right? So we can already see at the resolution of sampling that the, that, you know, and we've been talking about that, the notion that this is SARS version 2.0, that's a stretch. SARS is quite different yeah, in a lot of yeah. ways. And so any sort of um, focused vaccine strategies will probably be useless to this one. And then just like you're saying, come back in X years. And if we're just doing um, sort of specific vaccines, they'll be like, well, hold on. We yeah, it's not, the, it's not the solution. And, and you can't say, well, let's just develop them quickly because you, you got to make sure they're safe. Because if you put of something course. in people that makes them worse, then you're never going to be able to make a vaccine for that again. Yeah, agreed. Yep. So you have to be really, really careful. And, and you know, Great, yeah. people say, oh, we need it quickly. No, just calm down. <laughs> Take your time because you could end up making it worse than it is. Yeah. Yep. So one thing I wanted to ask you, Vincent, was um, just to maybe compare, if we compare the history of some of these recent outbreaks and epidemics, potentially pandemics, with some of the more kind of long running or familiar viruses. So obviously influenza, right? It's been um, hanging out for more than 100 years. In humans or HIV, which has been here now for probably coming up on 50 years. How would you compare those kind of cases of viruses um, with these emerging ones that sort of make a big splash, but then seem to kind of quickly fade from our attention in a year or two? I'm thinking of Zika virus, even mm. from a couple of years ago, SARS, MERS that we've been talking about, West Nile, um, still circulating to some degree. But how, how do you think about the SARS coronavirus 2 versus in, in kind of that framework? Well, I think right now it's spreading and so we're in in a period of uncertainty and that's what scares people and i i was thinking back on the 2009 h1n1 pandemic right mm -hmm. which began in mexico and then rapidly spread globally and people were freaking out about that too i mean that hit every country pretty much a lot of cases and i think it was the same of course you know 10 years makes a big difference in internet and news cycle and all that so we're accelerated now, but I think people were scared back then, and that's gone. Nobody, because that then became a seasonal <laughs> influenza virus that comes back every year, and we have a vaccine for it, and people don't want to take it. Most people don't take it, right? Yeah. Yep. So I think that is where we are now with this coronavirus. I have a feeling this virus is here to stay. It's infected enough people, either obviously or not obviously, subclinically, that it will probably be circulating all year round at some point in the globe and it will become a seasonal cold virus. We may have a vaccine for it and I would predict that a lot of people just won't take it. Mm, interesting. Now you contrast that to, I mean, Zika, yeah, the same thing. When it emerged, freak out globally. Mosquito-borne mm -hmm. virus that causes birth defects. Never heard of that right. before. Really right. unprecedented. And then it went away and nobody thinks twice of it. SARS is gone. SARS-1 is gone. 
Uh, MERS is limited to the Arabian Peninsula, you know, less than 2,000 cases. It never goes anywhere. Initially, people were amazed at it, and they thought it would go somewhere. Hmm. The only one that has endured uh, is uh, HIV AIDS. Yeah. And the thing is, when that started, it took years for people to even believe that it was an entity. Yeah, isn't that interesting? (laughs) You know, the first years here in the U.S., People didn't believe it, and then they didn't believe it was an infectious disease, and then they thought it was a gay disease only, right. and the president yeah. of the U.S. wouldn't even mention it for years. Oh, it was crazy. just unacceptable. Yeah. And now we're at the point where 37 million people are infected globally, mm-hmm. right? And we have great antiretrovirals, and many people kind of don't care about it anymore. It's faded from from view, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you're right. There's a cycle. There's an initial freak out for most viruses, except in the case of HIV AIDS. Although your viewer in the gay community, you were freaking out because all your friends were dying, right? No, of course. You read yeah, some yeah. of those early historical accounts and they were upset because nobody was helping them. Yeah. It's just, a, you know, I was reading a, a book recently, the blood industry hmm. denied that it existed. They probably cost millions of lives because of the one year that they said, no, oh, no, no, it's it's a very small fraction of the blood, it's okay. And then all sorts of people ended up getting infection and dying just because they got blood transfusions. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yep. so th- yep. this one will, will run its course um, and uh, end up being in the in the ignored dustbin, I guess. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but you're right, something else will come along, right? <laughs> no, right. Well, and so I wonder, I mean, influenza maybe in some ways is pretty unique in that it keeps, it's so seasonal, right? So you, we have flu seasons right, um, right. has been a massive challenge in terms and people working pretty hard and a lot of resources applied to sort of a broad vaccine platform, which has still mm-hmm. been, right. um, is still in the works, but has so far been really challenging. Um, and, but that's a virus that's been with us for a hundred years now. And we've kind of almost like, uh, you know, just sort of adapted to it or we don't even in the sense sort of psychologically adapted to it and that we don't sort of worry about it. And yet, I wonder if there's an analogy here. So if, you know, maybe the coronaviruses will become influenza-like, not in that they're kind of from the same strain that sort of goes um, under cover in bird populations or in other animals and then returns to humans, but whether it will be just sort of continuous, continuing to bubble up. And so I think that if that's true, and again, just speculation here, but then your strategy of broad vaccine platforms makes the most sense to me um, that we would be facing sort of new strains on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. I mean, I think if you could identify something that were present in a broad swath of, say, bat virus, uh, coronaviruses, that would be nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so the problem is then you you still, it's going to be different enough well, maybe it's not different. Maybe you can make something that would be broadly protective and test it and be ready with that because anything you have to make new, you have to test and that just delays it, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Yep. So, But that's a good question because it could be that if this sort of like spills over and then smolders out with with sort of independent um, replacement – Somehow, if then that becomes a bigger challenge, you have to know more about the virology or know more about the evolution of the viruses to be able to actually sort of know what it means to cover yeah. all the bases, right? Yeah. Well, you mentioned that the spike is the most variable, right, in these bat coronaviruses. Right. Well, that means there there are other proteins that are conserved, and I doubt there are tons of them. There are a lot of open reading frames. Have people looked systematically to see if any of them are highly conserved enough that we could use them as a protective immunogen? I doubt that because there's not a lot of resources going into coronas up till, you know, this, this month. (laughs) And now there will be more, I guess. Yeah, yeah, true. Yep. But, but, you know, flu, the next pandemic, people are going to freak out. No question. Because spreading and unknown, they don't know how far it will go, the extent of it. They won't know how many people are going to die. That is what freaks people out. Yeah, and exactly. so even though, you know, we're complacent with seasonal flu, the next pandemic, which will maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, who knows, mm-hmm. we'll get the same result. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. Vincent, I could talk for hours about this, but <laughs> but I actually- You have a class, so right? I do. Yeah. Coming up in about five minutes. Okay. So, let's do, um, want to do a of, quick pick? Yeah. Let's do a pick. So we actually, I had another paper, but we'll save that. Next time. Yeah. For next, yeah. And for another time. Um, 
just the conversation, I probably should have been able to predict that, that we would just get into it with the coronavirus has been, for me, has been totally fascinating and, and um, really enjoy um, talking about these ideas with you. But anyway, so my pick of the week is um, a TED Talk. It's by Alejandro Sanchez, one of my science heroes. He's at the Stowers Institute um, and was it, had a, opened his lab at Utah, moved a few years ago, about the time I showed up here. But he has a great TED Talk. It's called to Solve Old Problems, Study New Species. Hmm. And um, I've been meaning to put this on for a while, but uh, it's about a 10 to 15 minute t- TED talk. And, you know, I'll uh, say TED talks can be outstanding. They can also be a little bit of a mixed bag. This one is outstanding. I think it's been viewed by more than a million people. Yeah, it's and amazing. For, and for good reason, Alejandro brings the goods here as he talks about. So Alejandro does this spectacular work using planarians as a system to understand the um, phenomena of biological regeneration. So you can cut planarians into like a hundred pieces and you get a hundred new planaria. Um, Whereas if we cut off our arm, like you don't have an arm anymore. (laughs) And so how, you know, what is it that's different (laughs) about that regenerative capacity sort of in many um, systems? Um, In addition, Alejandro is doing some incredible stuff out at the woods hole um, marine biological laboratories in terms of new species discovery. He talks about that a little bit why, and makes, I think, one of the best cases I've heard for why we should be out there exploring, whether it's uh, in the oceans, whether it's in bats for these viruses that we've been talking about, why we should be searching and un- trying to understand the biology, the diverse, the biological diversity around us that we just have barely, you know, even scratched the surface. So anyway, if you have 10 minutes or so, uh, we'll put up the link and that's my science pick. It looks great. Week. Yeah. How about you, Vincent? What do you, what's your science pick here? So I want to pick the WHO SITREP page for the coronavirus disease this year. Good idea. Um, and we'll put a link because it's kind of long, but they have a sit rep almost every day where they summarize what's going on. And they really have the authoritative information. Now, people have been saying, well, they have what China releases. Well, what else would we have? That's all. But they get mm-hmm. it right from China. Mm-hmm. And so they're not as up to date as, say, the Hopkins site, mm-hmm. but um, they update it daily. And they have a lot of commentary and so forth. So it's really worth your time to go there. Yeah, very cool. Take a look. I also, what's the the SID wraps? That's this thing that's out of the um, University of Minnesota. Some of that's right. The They're very good also, there. yeah. They do, yeah. They do a frequent, I don't know if it's daily, maybe it's a daily summary of what's going on. And you you can subscribe to their uh, emails. I get it every day. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some good resources out there. Yep. All right. Twiv, Twivo 52. And uh, you can find it on any podcast player. The show notes, if you want to see the links we talk about, microbe.tv slash Twivo, if you like what we do. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could give us a little money to help out with our expenses. And we always love to get your questions and comments. Twivo at microbe.tv. Nels Eldies is available at cellvolution.org and on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Great to be joining you from LD Lab Studios. Really enjoyed today's conversation and looking forward to the ones ahead. I do. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, be curious. <laughs>